we we say to people like be yourself right go if you're going into an interview just be yourself or if you're pitching a venture capitalist just be yourself or you know you're going on a date with somebody new like just be yourself right but the thing is it's be yourself is actually horrible advice <laughs> All right, and welcome to the show. Johnny and I were laughing earlier about some of your work and, and this concept of quantifying the unquantifiable. Share with our audience how you got started and, and the work that led to this fantastic book, Edge. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know where you were going with that for a second. We were like, Johnny and I were laughing at your work. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, absolutely. It's funny because there were lots of people who were saying to me when I first started doing this work, um, you know, I said, I want to study gut feel. I want to study how people make decisions and how they use their gut feel and their intuition. And people were like, you can't study that. You're not going to be able to convince people that this is rigorous, in-depth research. Um, how are you ever going to run statistical analyses and quantify this? And I said to them, I'm going to quantify what gut feel is. And so a lot of my earliest work was looking at how, examining how people make decisions, um, looking for patterns and experiences and how they use their intuition to to make decisions. And of course, looking at angel investing uh, as a way to use this gut feel, obviously to make wealth and create these fantastic companies, how do we go about quantifying something like that? Yeah, I mean, I started studying investors for a number of reasons. I mean, one of the reasons was because this is a scenario where, um, you know, there's so much risk, there's so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty that it's almost unquantifiably, you know, unknowable. Um, and this is where, you know, even the the hard data, the things that we think are very analytical, um, you know, numbers, and those are even those are just hopes and dreams and guesses. These are projections, and mm -hmm. so people are making decisions all the time based on on their intuition. And the thing that I started finding as I as I dug into this research more and more and, and started doing more studies was that, you know, we tend to think that gut feel and intuition is something that's quick and subconscious and biased and emotional. But actually, it's very cognitive in nature. There's it's it's a blend of the emotional and the cognitive. And it takes into account people's experiences and backgrounds and the things that they've they've done. And in fact, in the investments the ecosystem in the investment sphere, those who use their gut feel actually make better decisions. Um, and so that led me to, um, you know, another line of research that looked at when, you know, are there contexts in which we should be using our intuition? Are there contexts in which it's better to be more analytical? And I found that, yeah, it totally depends, right? There's there's absolutely situations where you wanna be very analytically driven and some where you don't wanna be analytical at all and just by riding by the seat of your pants and, and sort of making decisions based on how you feel and what your intuition is. Part of intuition is knowing the difference, knowing which contexts in which you want to be more analytical and and when you want to be more intuitive. Um, and the tricky thing is that you change one variable, right? You change the industry or you change the mix of people that you're interacting with and everything changes. So there's this nuance that that is involved with um, knowing how to act, how to perceive, how to use your intuition in different situations. Um, because we're social creatures and we're always interacting with other people. And so uh, when we're all in our heads, we're not taking into account what's happening on the other end. When I hear this, one of the things I think about is card games, poker. Yeah. And did you find when you were interviewing these these investors where you're talking to them, did, did gambling, did poker, did any of these sort of strategic games come into play that they did they mention this you know where that comes into play is honing your ability to 
read other people, honing your ability to perceive others and knowing the standpoint that they come from, like where they're coming from, because everyone else has their own background, their own experiences, their own perspectives. And so we talk a lot about self-awareness and self-awareness is certainly a part of it, but self-awareness only makes sense in relation to who that other self is, who that other person is. And so we do need to have a baseline understanding of who we are, but that baseline understanding only takes us so far because so much of success and outcomes and the interaction we have with other people are, are based on that space between, the space between ourself and that other person. Now, obviously, when it comes to angel investing, it, it self-selects for a level of success to have the capital to invest and a successful network to have the deals to even invest in. And for those of us who may not trust our intuition or our gut, you mentioned earlier experience being a big part of it. How can we develop a stronger intuition to utilize to our advantage? Yeah, I mean, I think the that honing piece, like how do you hone that intuition is so critical. And what you're saying is is absolutely true, right? You don't have deep pockets. If you're not able to cut lots of checks, it's harder to hone that because you don't have the chance to make the mistakes, right? Someone, when I first started doing angel investing, one of the first pieces of advice that I got was never write a check for an amount that you're not willing to burn. Right. So if you're going to write a check for ten thousand dollars, you need to be ready to burn ten thousand dollars in cash because that is ultimately what is going to happen. Um, so you need to be able to have those those experiences and be able to make those mistakes over and over and over again to to learn and develop. So when you don't have that and, you know, how do you actually develop that? Well, a lot of it goes to, you know, this is something that people can absolutely learn. You can learn how to um, be better at interpersonal perception. You can be very, you can be better at investing. You can be better at using your intuition. Um, you can learn it, but not everybody is willing to do it because even though you you can learn it, you have to be willing to do the one thing that a lot of people aren't willing to do, and that is embarrass yourself. You have to be willing to embarrass yourself. That's how you hone your intuition, by putting yourself out there, taking these massive chances, not taking small chances where you learn very little at a time, but taking huge leaps where you learn a lot at a time. And the problem is a lot of times when we do that, we'll we'll face that one big embarrassment or that one big instance of backlash And then all of a sudden we're like, oh no, I don't ever want to have that feeling again, right? That was, that was terrifying or that didn't sit well with me. Um, And that prevents us from learning and developing our intuition. So it takes a level of humility. It takes a willingness to be embarrassed. Um, It takes a willingness to approach situations that even though you know the deck is stacked against you, that you still go for it anyways. Now, for the last decade plus, we've been beating this drum very heavily that social skills are that opportunity for an unfair advantage Uh where everyone else is working really hard and we've heard the age old adage, hey, work harder than everyone else. Mm -hmm. But what are the biggest social skills deficits in the workplace today? Because the book starts with this fantastic graph showing just Mm -hmm. how many jobs now no longer rely on basic tasks and automation is replacing them, but social skills are now at a premium. So what are they and where are the deficits that you found? Yeah, totally. I mean, this is the thing, right? We've been taught from a really young age that hard work is the secret to success, right? You ask people who are Olympians, um, you ask people who are CEOs, top executives of companies, um, you know, you ask anybody who has achieved these indicators of success and you say, how did you achieve your success? And they're like, hard work, just keep working hard, put in the time, put in the heart. And the, the issue is that we teach our kids this, we teach, you know, people to put in the hard work, but we find that, you know, very quickly we are sort of disenchanted finding that, you know, hard work doesn't always speak for itself that you can take two different people who work equally as hard and one person will inevitably be more successful than the other. 
And that's because the world is driven by signals and perceptions and stereotypes and all of these sorts of things. And so those are the types of social skills that we need to, number one, understand are important. And number two, be able to develop in ourselves. And number three, be able to tailor it to the right situations that we're going to be in. These are, these are skills like knowing ourselves, but also being able to know the, the counterpart, knowing how the counterpart is going to be perceiving us. Um, because different people are going to perceive us in different ways. Some people are going to see those stereotypes. Some people are going to see those stereotypes and try and go beyond. Some people are not going to see those stereotypes at all. And so it's really up to us to guide those perceptions and be able to, to, to interact with people in, in a way that will make our hard work work harder for us. Um, so that it's not just your hard work speaking for itself, it's your hard work speaks, but you're also helping to amplify and have it speak on behalf of what you're doing. And what I found so fascinating is looking at what are our weaknesses and turning them into an advantage, which I think is very intimidating for a lot of people. Obviously what we're talking about here are perceptions and biases that happen regardless of our abilities that are natural to all of us, right? Socialization is such a huge part of our career and our ability to persuade others is going to influence how far we go. And at the same time, we're working against stereotypes and things that are completely out of our control. So it's easy to fall back to, well, I'm the victim. I'm not outgoing. I don't have a great first impression. I don't have a network or, you know, maybe I'm an ethnicity that's judged in a certain manner. I don't have privilege. And your book focuses on turning that into an advantage, creating your own privilege. What do you mean by creating your own privilege? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of things that you're sort of touching on there, right? I mean, the first is we talk about, you know, some people naturally have an advantage and other people have to make one for themselves. And that can change based on the situation that you're in. And when we talk about privilege, it almost has this like, you know, it's almost this loaded term now. It's like this negative word. Like we don't want to be, we don't want to be associated with the word privilege because there's 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 something around around that word. And you know, it doesn't have to be that it's this negative. You know, you talked about you talk you guys talk a lot about unfair advantage, right? And we're okay with the word advantage. We're not okay with the word unfair. And what privilege really is, is unfair advantage, right? And so why is that? And what is it about the, the advantage piece that's okay? And when we tie it with unfair, but it's warranted, it's a meritocratic thing, then all of a sudden we're okay with it. And so, you know, the premise that a lot of my research builds on is that you can make your own privilege and that privilege doesn't have to be this dirty word um, that, that, that you say. Um, you can flip things in your favor to to get the sort of outcomes that you're looking for and that you deserve. Um, the second piece of what you're sort of saying that I think is really interesting is a lot of people don't do this because when we talk about changing people, like turning people's stereotypes to work in our favor or switching things so that it gives us an advantage, people start to think like it feels strategic. It feels like I'm managing impressions or that I'm, you know, that it, it feels almost gross, like I'm manipulating or something. And, you know, in fact, the thing is, people are going to have impressions of you. They're going to have first impressions of you, regardless of whether you guide them and to their, your impressions or not, right? They're going to have an impression of you. And if they have the wrong impression of you, it's a lot more work and a lot more, it's less authentic for you to then have to change their impressions back to who you authentically are. If you start with knowing who you are and being unapologetic, uh, unapologetic about who you are and guiding those perceptions, it's actually better off. It's not strategic at all. You're showing them who you authentically are and giving them that that information, the, the information about the value you provide, the information about who you are. You know, I, I always talk about how, you know, people, we, we, we say to people, like, be yourself, right? Go, if you're going into an interview, 
just be yourself. Or if you're pitching a venture capitalist, just be yourself. Or you know, you're going on a date with somebody new. Like just be yourself, right? Um, but the thing is, it's be yourself is actually horrible advice because <laughs> yeah. there are so many versions of yourself, right? It's really like be yourselves. It's it's like a diamond, right? And each person is a diamond, but you can look at that diamond from different angles and it's gonna sparkle in different ways, right? And under certain lighting, it's gonna maybe shine more or in certain rooms or in certain like, you know, I don't, like different, different contexts and different situations, you're gonna see that diamond differently. And when you guide those perceptions, it's not strategic. Instead, it's showing them that angle of your diamond that's gonna shine the brightest and is gonna show them how you enrich and provide value, it's still the same diamond. You're still yourself, you're still authentically that diamond, but you're just positioning it and showing it at that angle in which it's going to give you the most, the, the richest sort of experience with that other person. One of the things that I loved is this idea, if, there, if you were walking into a meeting and, and let's say that there's gonna be an, an obvious stereotype or a bias going against you or working with you to go ahead and call that out and have some fun with it right now we're in a place uh, we get letters all the time of guys girls everyone's afraid to say the wrong thing everyone is on tiptoes everyone is walking on eggshells 24 7 and now going into trying to do some business trying to work and to call out the bias or the stereotype or whatever's going on to make light of it just puts everyone in a position of that's now out of the way yeah now and and doing this did you encounter any pushback or any issues in in viewing it and stating this and putting it out like that it's amazing i mean there is we're there's so much backlash now Right? I mean, it's like we we say something and yeah. immediately instead of instead of that message, we're thinking like, did we say it in the right way? Did we go yeah. too far? Did that person interpret it in the right way? You know, it's we're in this world where we no longer think about the intent versus the impact, right? This is something that yeah. I talk about with my students all the time, which is like, if somebody says something, right? Are we interpreting the intent behind that? Or are we interpreting the impact of that? Like, is it the impact that I felt affronted by that comment, even though that person didn't intend to do that, mm -hmm. right? And when you lose that element of it, you you start going off of some really dangerous cues. Yes. And it 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 sort of prevents conversations from from you know progressing in all different mm -hmm. directions. So, you know, I mean there's number one, I think we also forget that everybody has something. What I mean by that is like we there's like the the typical, you know, like we talk about gender and race and class and you know the the typical cast of characters, but everybody mm -hmm. has something. You go into a situation yeah. and everyone feels, you know, either self-conscious about something that might be more of a hidden thing or something that they're thinking in their head. Everyone's being judged regardless of what you have. And like we've gotten into this bias Olympics to some extent of who has it, <laughs> who has it worse. And it's not to say that some people don't face tons and tons of disadvantage and tons and tons of experiences of being underestimated. But I think, you know, we have to realize that it's an imperfect system. We're trying to change the system. And in order to change the system, we have to be able to do it from the inside out as well as the outside in. And so doing it from the inside out means that we do try and understand people's impact and their intent. And if those two things don't jive, trying to figure out what happened. Um, and the second piece of this is figuring out what happened by evaluating the statement and the person as two completely different things, right? Imagine one person says something and it comes off completely wrong. If you switch that person's gender, race, whatever, and had that same person saying that same comment, does that sit differently, 
right? Does that, is it somehow now going to be interpreted differently? Is it somehow going to like, would you now laugh rather than being upset, you know? And it's, so it's thinking about those types of things and not calling out the person. Like you said this, so now every single fiber of your being mm -hmm. is associated with that comment and the type of person that I visualize that person is um, as, as as being. So you know, it's 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 very much like going back. I feel like to to these roots and understanding. And you know, honestly, who has not? How, who in this world hasn't said something wrong at some point? Like who hasn't said right. something and been like, daily? Oh man. <laughs> If you've been listening, yeah. <laughs> Daily. Right? Like, I, we all do that. We say things and we're like, oh, we totally didn't mean it like that. Right? And so if we go back to, like, those situations that we've been in and we're like, and then we, we, we allow ourselves to see that in the people who maybe have said something that we take a front with, um, I think it just creates this different level of, of understanding. In the investment space, especially angel investing, the, the obvious bias that everyone is aware of is female founders tend to get investment at a lower rate than male counterparts. And then there was even uh, a little adage of the more attractive the male is, the, the more likely he is to, to get funding. Somebody's so, been reading my research. I'm so <laughs> impressed. <laughs> so, so going along with that, what have you found that the successful female founders do to give themselves an advantage against that bias that allows them to get funding? Yeah, I mean, what you're kind of saying, right, is that is, is absolutely true, right? Women are getting 2% of the venture capital, all of the venture capital financing that's out there, right? So it's abysmally low. And, you know, there are lots of different things that we've shown that have impacted, um, that have been, you know, that, that have shown to predict why this might be. Um, things like, you know, when, uh, when you're more attractive, men that are more attractive get more funding than men that are unattractive. Um, but, both of those are higher than than both attractive and unattractive females. Um, so it's it's sort of a, a depressing kind of finding. But the thing to realize is that it's both male and female investors that are doing the biasing, right? So in some of my other work, I find, for example, that men and women – male and female entrepreneurs are getting asked different types of questions, right? So male entrepreneurs are more likely to get asked questions about potential, like how big could you take this? Where do you see this going? What's your vision? And women are more likely to get asked questions about risk, like how are you preventing against this? You know, have you controlled against these risk factors? Um, and that leads to right men being able to respond in bigger more promotional ways and women responding in more risk focused ways and then the men get the funding right but both male and female investors are asking these questions it's not just male investors that are doing the biasing it's female investors that are also doing it and so the solutions we've got lots of sort of solutions that we're playing with which involve things like having more women investors having more women mentors and that's certainly going to help but that can't be it Right. It has to be something. There has to be other solutions if we know that women are doing this just as much as as, as male as their male investor counterparts. So um, what I found in my research is that the best way to sort of counteract these effects and the last couple of years I've, I've, I've been studying almost exclusively how do we inoculate against these sort of biases because it's sort of depressing to, to hear about all of these these negative findings and um, it's really around guiding how you how you're you're being seen and it's about stopping and redirecting and constantly redirecting um, how how the message is unfolding redirecting that trajectory um, and so for example when you recognize that you're getting asked a question that's very much about risk and your competitors you answer the question quickly but then you say something like and because we're able to you know go head to head with these competitors it opens up this 
opportunity, all of these other opportunities, and you very quickly bring it to your vision and how big it is and how scalable the company is and all of these really big opportunistic types of things. And so then you're back on sort of level playing ground, if not better off. Um, so lots of different examples of how you can stop and redirect to, to um, counteract these effects. So knowing that your first impression is something you can improve, knowing that perceptions are something that are going to be universal going in both sexes do it these biases exist and fighting against it or or putting your hands over your ears and, and <laughs> pretending they're not there is not helpful and it sounds like there's a lot of prep here and and johnny and i love a great acronym the book is all about this acronym of edge so let's break down what you mean by edge and go through how our listeners can start building these advantages against these biases that we all face. You got the acronym. I'm so ex I'm I'm thrilled that you that you got it because um you know the book is about how do you gain an edge, um, mm -hmm. but I don't ever explicitly say that edge stands for you know, these four things. And so that was my little way of kind of putting in, um, trying to delight people who kind of read it and was like, and were like, Oh, it stands for, for something. <laughs> so gaining an edge is, um, based on four components. Um, E D G E. So the E, the first E is, um, about enrich. It's about how do you enrich? How do you provide value? Um, your message, your ability to achieve success, it's all based on your ability to provide value and enrich what you're working on, enrich what others are working on. And so it goes back to knowing what are the ways in which you enrich? What are your superpowers? The now, it, it well, just there was one point that I wanted to clear up there, and it was that you mentioned that there is two parts for enrich, two parts for value, knowing the value that you're bringing, but also it doesn't really matter all that much if the other party doesn't understand or know your value. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, enrich is, is, is one of those things where like you might know you provide a lot of value, mm -hmm. but other people need to know that too. And the problem is that there are definitely people who have that second part, which is other people think that they provide value, but there's no substance behind it. That's where we get so frustrated because, you know, those are the people that are really good at posturing and catering and, and, and giving the semblance of having value, but they don't actually have anything to, to back it up. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is there's people who go on that for a really long time. Like you can pretty, you can ride that wave for a pretty long time. <laughs> um, but where it really sustains is when you have both pieces, that you actually do provide value and that other people know it as well. The problem is that, you know, we don't always have the, the opportunity to show people how we enrich because maybe we don't belong to the right circles or people are not giving us those opportunities. And so D, the D of edge is for delight which is, you know, in order to be given that opportunity, you need to get that entree, you need to get that entrance. And you get that entrance by people who have written you off, but you surprise them in some small way. You do something that's counterintuitive or slightly off-putting or slightly unexpected, and then it makes them sort of say, huh, like, I didn't expect that, and it makes them take notice. And that's when you can then start to show how you enrich, and you know, that delight, that feeling that, that I'm trying to bottle and encapsulate, like people are like, how do you know? Like, what is that? A, <laughs> you know, it's like the first time you took Uber, right? Forget all the other stuff about Uber and, and all of the subsequent things and the management and all of that. But like, think back to the very first time. I remember it very <laughs> clearly. And I, I, I remember hearing about it. I wrote on Twitter. I said, how's this different than a cab? Okay. And they said, use it and find out. Here's a code. Yep. And I took it to the airport and I was like, I'm delighted. I'm, I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, I'm delighted. Like, it's this weird, like, you had, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I have this weird feeling of like, oh my gosh, this is sort of cool. I'm in some stranger's car <laughs> and they know where they're taking. So it's like simultaneously terrifying but also really cool. And, and you know, all these questions are going through your head. Like, so I don't 
pay them cash. Like it just takes care of itself and they know where I'm going and I just get out and say thanks and buy. Like there's all of these sort of emotions and feelings and like that's delight. Like you're intrigued, you're surprised. You've got this simultaneous feeling of being terrified and impressed and delighted all at the all at the same time. That's that's when you get the opportunity to um, show how you provide value. Now, I just want to jump back to Enrich because I, I do feel like both sides of the coin, there are very few that master, and a lot of us get struggle. A lot of us struggle around the idea of being an advocate for ourselves and demonstrating that value because we don't want to be the bragger, we don't want to be the brown noser. And what ends up happening is realistically, whether it's an investor or your boss, they're not paying attention to everything that you're doing and all the value you bring. You're a cog in a process that's running. And unless you're advocating for yourself, no one else is running in there and saying, AJ did this fantastic job. You need to promote him or you need to invest in him. And for those of us who feel weird around this idea of, hey, I, I get bringing value, but it's the, the showing it and, and allowing other people to see it that I struggle with. Do you have some tips or some strategies that have you've seen work in the investment space or in the corporate world? Yeah, such a great question, right? Because, you know, the 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 point of this, right, is that we do want to be showing our best selves and we do want to be advocating for for ourselves, but it can go horribly wrong, right? It can be go horribly wrong where we are seen as bragging or, you know, um, not not sort of sharing the credit and, you know, and so it's like this fine line between how you do it. And um, I think that's where, you know, it, it even though these are four different pieces of the framework, they all intersect and go together, right? You, you're you not just delighting and then all of a sudden you move on to G, which is guiding. Um, you're not just delighting and then all of a sudden you're done delighting because now you can enrich and they're, they're totally on board with everything. As you're enriching, you have to continue to guide and be guiding that message and guiding how they see you. And a big part of this is not being over-prepared, right? We just like we sort of say like work hard work hard work hard we're always like prepare make sure that you're so prepared that you know this thing cold well actually that prevents us from having a lot of these authentic opportunities to delight and show how we enrich right it means it doesn't mean don't prepare at all but like have a couple of bullet points like know what your two or three superpowers are and you know we don't we're not cognitively set up where our brains are not big enough to remember 16 things at once and when we try to it makes us stiff it makes us seem like we're braggarts it makes us seem like we're trying too hard or that we're trying to game the system like be confident be willing to embarrass yourself be willing to have humility know a couple of things that you want to be saying and then dynamically sort of improvise off of those things because you've got loose guidelines and when you do that in a in a sort of general sense it it allows you to to really achieve these perceptions and these authentic perceptions of of yourself in in a much more holistic and realistic realistic way um it also helps you um you know it's the people who do this the best and it's something that's so hard is like realizing this is not a zero-sum game it's not that when i win somebody else has to lose or when somebody else wins i lose it's realizing that this universe is huge there's a really (laughs) big pie and there's lots to be to be shared and when we're showing a version of ourselves that you know is 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 something that we're really proud of it doesn't mean that we can't also be showcasing other people and 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 doing it with the best interests of other people at heart right the people who do this the best are the ones who don't ever sacrifice other people they're not willing to step on other people for their own gain well this quote that you have i just love it and i think it works really well because with a lot of our clients they are afraid to promote themselves or to show their skills or to to put out that story and you this quote of if you don't give your own story of who you are that story will be given to you and that well, that if that doesn't present the urgency of why you need to learn this skill and have it in your pocket and put it together, uh, I, I then I don't have anything else to tell you. But I mean that that sums it up. Yeah. 
we love telling stories about other people. Like we meet somebody once, and we're like, <laughs> oh, they must have like they must have had a rough childhood, or they must have like this, or like in college they must have been such a jock, or like we tell these stories about people based on you know we we love inventing stories about other people, and in re- in actuality, people have such fascinating stories, and everyone mm-hmm. you know. It's you should be sharing your stories. You should be giving them this sort of you know, I was talking to somebody today and we were talking about like how we were in high school and you know, and he was saying and he was sort of laughing at me because I was talking about how, you know, he's like, Well, what were you good at in high school? What were you good at? And I'm like, I was good at math <laughs> And he's like, That's not like and I was like, you know, it's you know, it sounds like people hate, you know, you don't hate me for that. Cause I wasn't very, I wasn't very good at other things. Like I wasn't good at sports and I, and I was, and I was so painfully shy that I didn't really, you know, th- that's what I was good at. I loved how orderly it was. It was so dependable. Like I was really good at math. And he was like, I was horrible at school. You know, I was, I played every single sport. I was like a solid C student. And we were laughing about like, our trajectories and our stories and how like today, you know, fast forward, you know, 20, 30 years later that we're able to like really connect on this level that, um, that we, we wouldn't have been able to, you know, years and years ago. And, you know, if he had just heard me say like, I'm really good at math, he would have written me off and like painted my whole trajectory from the age of like 13 to the age I am now of this story of, you know, and, and not gotten like who I am and, and, you know, sort of the, the, the parts of me that are really provocative and outspoken because it would have been replaced with these stories about how I was really shy and introverted. And, and so it's just amazing how you can have these connections with people when you do tell your own story. And, and unashamedly, unabashedly share that story. You know, now it, it's one of those things that we laugh about in our course that you can own the narrative around embarrassment and shame as a youth. You can own that story of, yeah, I was a little dorky or I was a little nerdy based on conventions, but look at who I am now. That's what matters. The flip side of this, going back to delight, you know, for us, we've talked ad nauseum about humor and how important it is. And Everyone gets it in a social setting, but whenever we say, hey, no, we want you to be humorous at work. We want you to be humorous in a pitch. Bringing humor actually helps. They always scrunch their face, shake their head. No, that's not going to work. You actually dig into a study in the book about how humor can manage impressions and actually project competence and higher status. I found that so fascinating because we've been saying it without knowing the science and and it's something that's counterintuitive because most of us go into those very professional settings and and think the only part of my diamond to borrow your analogy that i can show is the non-humorous serious aj yeah absolutely i mean the humor part of it is tricky because we sort of all are like yeah we know that humor is good people respond to it but like when you say to someone like be funny like it's really hard to be like be funny right if someone says like to me be funny i'm like oh like i don't know what to say that like because humor is is it's like a it, it's a it's a reciprocal thing right it's 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 a it's something that again like you you're you're funniest when you're sort of improvising you're funny when you're yes. when you're reading what's happening and you're reading the context and it's almost like an offhanded thing that you that you sort of say that's that's really funny, right? Um, you know, I I like I I love to sort of share the example of the when I met Hassan Minaj, who is you know for his job he has to be fun, like that's his job to be to be funny. And I tell this story about how like I within like a couple of seconds made him laugh, and I was like, that is like you know that is weird. Like how did I? But he was like he he you know so but it was really this thing where it was uh, he. It was sort of like, a, how do comedians be funny? How do comedians sound stay funny? How do professors stay educated? Like we were making these jokes and going back and forth based on who he was as a comedian and who I was as a professor. And I was able to be funny because I know what being a professor is like. And I was giving sort of offhanded comments about something that I knew. 
something that was really me and was one of my like basics, right? Like one of my basic goods that I talk about. Like when you enrich, think about like what really authentically makes you you, right? It would never work for me to go out there and and try and, um, you know, I, and I've tried this, right? Like when I, for one of my earliest jobs, people were like, you need to network. Like you need to meet some of the top executives, like go out to lunch with them, go out to drinks with them. And, and I was like, okay, okay. I need to like network. I need to meet these people. And I would feel like I'd have, I'd be like, can we go to lunch together? Like, can we grab after the Kuwait drink, like drinks after, like, it's so weird, right? Like I'm sitting there with this, this executive. And then the whole time the conversation is forced. He doesn't want to be there. I'm like feeling uncomfortable because I'm like, I'm wasting this person's time. Um, but when you find those authentic opportunities to to do that and 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 one of these executives that I share the story of is how you know we ended up um, on the same airplane at one point at this conference and as we were leaving the plane he was like oh do you do you have a ride to the to the conference hotel you know my driver is here to pick me up and I was, you know, like my private driver is here to pick me up. And I'm like, oh yeah, my private driver is here to pick me up too. You know, my private Uber driver. And, um, and then he, you know, sort of chuckled and he was like, come, why don't you, why don't you come and ride in my private car? And we had this 45 minute chat through, you know, from the airport to the hotel where it was not forced. It was not me saying like, give up an hour of your time to have lunch with me and let me try and wow you so that you like me so that now I've networked. It was like, we're going to this conference hotel. There was no pressure for me to talk about anything in particular. So we were able to talk about like, you know, our dogs and our childhoods and, you know, what we think about, you know, the chance, how the Yankees are going to do this year. And like we formed this authentic connection. And then to this day, he's still one of my, you know, the, one of my champions, the people I go to because we were able to do that. And it was based on this premise of like real humor of him seeing um, the 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 nature of my funny rather than the nature of a funny that I was trying to attribute to myself falsely. So it's understanding the pitch inside and out and being prepared, but that should give you the freedom then to be situational, be observational and call out the obvious to break that tension. And, and of course, whether it's a pitch or whether it's a job interview or performance review, everyone knows what's going to happen. Everyone knows exactly what to expect. It's when you zig and everyone's expecting <laughs> you to zag exactly. that you stand out and that gives you that edge and, and delight is a big part of that. Now, of course, guide is the, the meat guides the project because it's ongoing. You, you have to keep honing this story. It's not just tell your story once and assume the world knows it and they're just going to cheer you on. Yeah. How do we continue to guide and form this edge and advantage that we're looking for? Yeah. You have to have lots of degrees of freedom, right? When you are prepared and you're able to, and you know, I mean, the trickiest part is having that self-awareness of who you are and that awareness of how the other person is seeing you. Being able to have those experiences where you can be in front of different people and being like, this person's going to see me differently than that person. And when you have that sort of awareness, then you're able to build in your build in more freedom for yourself to go in different directions, try out different things and be able to, and, and be able to sort of, sort of delight. And, you know, it's, it, it is really hard because, um, you know, in, People sort of ask me often, like, you study how to turn disadvantage into an advantage, and you study how to take obstacles and constraints and flip them in your favor. So, what are the 10 steps? What are the three steps? Or, what are, you know, what are the steps that I need to do to get there? How do I gain an edge? And the thing is, I mean, like, I would love to be able to give everybody a recipe and be like, here's what you do. You mix a little of this and a little of that. But it's, it's not a, it, it, it's not a recipe. It's not um, like the 10 steps to gaining an edge because if I did give that to you, it wouldn't work as well, right? Really what it is, it's a perspective. It's a perspective for thinking it through so that you can develop your own unique edge. That's where you get the unfair piece because when you've 
taking that perspective and making it yours and making it your unique edge is when it becomes a much you know, sharper edge and a much more refined and a much more useful and effective um, edge than if you're just going to import it from, from somebody else. So taking that perspective and then continuously developing it and honing it and practicing it, um, that's where, you know, and I offer lots of different strategies for ways that you can hone it, right? So being able to practice doing this in a variety of different situations. So i um, happy to give you, you know, like I'll give you one example of this just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, there's one exercise that I do with my students, which is called the 10 no's exercise. And the goal of it is in one week, they have to um, get 10 people to say no to them. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and you know, and, and the point of this is sort of, number one, when we're asking people, we're, we're not really ever in situations where we're thinking like, I'm trying to get a no. We're always trying to ask for things by trying to get a yes, right? Getting them to agree to something. And when you're trying to get actively get a no, when your homework assignment is to get a no, it changes the way you interact with people. So you start to learn like, hey, like you start to see patterns and see differences that you didn't normally see throughout the course of your life. The second thing you learn is that it's actually a lot harder to get people to say no than you think, right? People are not equipped to say no. They're, if you get at somebody hedging or, or some sort of a, you know, a yes, but I, no, but I'll do this for you instead, like if they, um, that doesn't count, right? It has to right. be a full-fledged no. It can't be a concession, right? So it only counts it's a full-fledged no. And so you realize like how extreme some of these requests have to get before you actually get a no. And in going through this exercise, you learn, you learn like the whole goal is to sort of embarrass yourself and get a no. The whole point of this is for you to get a no. So you have permission now to go and do these sort of things that you never would have done before. And so there's all sorts of exercises and strategies that I talk about in developing this intuition and developing your ability to interact with others. And everyone's intuition of the no tends to, especially with inexperience, tends to create this box around yourself that's completely invisible. And we assume that the no is going to happen rapidly and people are going to be comfortable saying no to us when in fact the opposite is true. And we've been doing this exercise for decades with our clients. And one of our favorite examples is we were out one night and we said, okay, same thing, go get 10 no's. Since you're so afraid of getting a no and, and being rejected, let's push through this and see what you can get away with. And he was chatting up this gentleman at the bar And he's trying to get a no, actively trying to get a no. And he walks back over to us with a key to a Porsche 911 (laughs) and his face is white. And he's like, I don't know how to drive a stick. And we're like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I did the exercise. I'm trying to ask for a no. So I asked if I could drive this guy's car. And he's like, yeah, here you go. Here's my keys. Where do you need to go? And now he's holding this guy's keys. And he's like, I thought for sure I would get a no asking if I could borrow a stranger's car. We create these bounds, these limiting beliefs around ourselves that unless we are actively testing them, we can't build that intuition to gain the edge. I want to add to that. Your worldview and how important it is, how how you go out into the world and and what you can do and, and what's acceptable, that is all placed on you. And if you haven't done the work to meticulously test all these ideas, then you've, then you've adopted one that somebody has handed to you. And if it was a, a worldview that was handed to you by CNN or Fox news, or you're going to have some crazy ideas about what's going on. And the only way to pierce through that is an exercise like that, where you all of a sudden you not, you just, you just through this experience have, now have went from everyone's mean and cold and, and and unfriendly to actually everyone is actually really nice and very friendly and, <laughs> and, and actually accommodating and that and that that shift can only happen through your own personal experience. I could tell you that all day long, 
But if you don't go out and do the exercise, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. Absolutely. And everyone's being viewed in different ways too, right? So yes. if I were to ask somebody to drive their Porsche 911, they'd be like, you know, there might be percent like, what? You're Asian. You're a hor- you're a woman. You're a horrible driver. Why would I drive <laughs> my Porsche 911, right? But if I was like, let me take your child for 24 hours right? And they might be like, yeah, you look dependable. Like you're a professor, (laughs) you teach at Harvard. Like, yeah, of course, let take my child for 24 hours, right? It it really changes based on who you are and who they, who they kind of see you as. And, you know, some of it's sort of sad, right? It's sad that like, there are these sort of stereotypes, but because there are these stereotypes, it also gives you the power to flip them. Like, because you know about them, because I know that I'm going to be interpreted in certain ways, that's powerful. It's powerful to know the negative perceptions that people have of me, too, Um, because that gives me information that I can use if I choose to use it in a way that can put me back into um, a position where I do have advantages. So, you know, it's it's an important thing to sort of remember that, um, you know, the, the very thing that is poisoning um, what we experience is the, is, the, is the anecdote to what can fix it as well. So Now, one of the things that I found in, in coaching a lot of our clients who are starting out in their career as top performers, they're, they're pretty much thrown into the deep end. And in these situations, they feel the need to ask a ton of questions. And unfortunately, when we ask a ton of questions, we're also then perceived as lacking in competence and unable to do our job. So then the flip happens and they don't ask any questions and then they can't even achieve the results that they're looking for because they're totally lost. So for those who are starting out in their career, who are feeling this imbalance and and wanting to turn that perception from being someone who's lacking in competence to someone who's a top performer, what can we do knowing that that's going to be the perception put on us as a, a beginner or a junior at a company? Yeah, you know what's so interesting there is that, you know, there's two different types of questions, right? There's the questions that we ask and there's the questions that others ask of us. And we don't often effectively use either of those in the right ways or in the most effective ways, right? So you spoke first about asking lots of questions and seeming not competent and and you know other other sorts of interpretations that people might have of us it's asking the right questions right it's asking questions like what's the point of your question right is it to inform is it to learn is it to you know there's all of these different reasons why we ask questions and the the most effective types of questions are the ones that indicate that you know there's research that's been done that shows that the, the, the best type of question is one that simultaneously shows that you've listened and you're building on, right? So somebody says something and you ask a question that acknowledges that you heard and then takes it one layer, one layer further. And, and that sort of shows that not only are you competent because you listened and understood, but that you're inquisitive and curious and want to continue learning because you take it that one, one layer further. The, the part that we forget a lot is the questions that are asked of us, right? And we don't use those opportunities in well enough. Like we sort of like, we're thinking about what we want to say to the net. We were thinking about the next question we want to ask, or we're thinking about like our to-do list or the next things that we're going to be doing. And we don't take advantage of the questions that, that, that other people have. When other people are asking questions, like that is your opportunity to shine. Right. That is your way of like, that's when you can really wow them. You know, it's especially like I when I study when I study pitches. So a lot of my my data and a lot of the the studies that I've done have been looking at have looked at um, pitch competitions and the way in which people present themselves to investors. And overwhelmingly, entrepreneurs think of pitching as selling like they give a pitch and they think about selling, but it's not selling. Pitching is about starting a conversation. So when you pitch, instead of like going out there and trying to wow them through your pitch, your your pitch should instead be little cues of questions that people will then ask of you, right? So you'll say something like, 
this product has, you know, this product is top of the line, the technology is blah, 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 whatever. As soon as you say something like top of the line, people will ask you about the technology behind it, the engineering behind it. You don't need to say that in your pitch. They'll ask you that question and then that's when you mm -hmm. wow them with your like, and I am like a PhD, I have a PhD in physics and I developed this algorithm through the 10 years and it works through this and that. Not only have you not wasted your pitch time, but you're actually wowing them through the questions and engaging them in a dialogue and use the conversation of interest. So effectively using both the questions you ask and the questions you receive can really allow you to prevent from a lot of those initial perceptions that may be leading to the subpar you know, outcomes. I think it's funny. I mean, a lot of that is in, in copy as well. Like you don't want to give them all the information. You want to give them just enough for them to get curious to peer further. And then you have the open door of here's everything you've just asked for. And it's, they're happy because they are the ones that asked for it. <laughs> but if you give them that all up front, they're like, what is this? I can't make heads or tails. This is too much. I don't know where to begin. I'm out of here. Absolutely. And they also don't understand. They don't, they also don't understand everything that you're saying in the pitch. <laughs> and so they don't want to look like idiots. So they like right. latch onto like one small thing that they do understand, which is maybe so tangential to what you're actually doing. And then the questions mm -hmm. go off on this completely different, you know, thing. And, and you're not able to actually impress them with what you're actually doing so you're you're absolutely right now not to leave the audience hanging the the last letter in our acronym here edge is effort and we talked about this at the start hard work isn't enough everyone is working hard everyone is trying to prove their worth so what is that extra effort that we need to be putting in to stand out to get that advantage yeah so that e that effort that effort and hard work comes last right? It's the last in the E-D-G-E, in gaining an edge. We tend to think that hard work and effort comes first, right? You put in the hard work, you'll get the rewards. You put in the hard work, you'll see the success. But in fact, actually, hard work should come last. You should be thinking about how you enrich and provide value and how you delight and how you guide. Because when you do all of those things, then when you put in the hard work, your hard work goes that much farther for you. That's when the hard work speaks for itself because you've already positioned yourself in a way that you're showing how you enrich, delight, and guide, and then your hard work really does work harder for you. So that's why that last E is effort and it comes last. I, this is so funny to me. So I'm 46, growing up in the 80s, and especially in the eight, eight, late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember the company, but there was a commercial and it was a bunch of young folk who are getting job interviews and they're out in the, they just graduated, they're in the field and they're, they're interviewing for jobs. And they kept saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm a people person. I'm a people person. And the whole point of the commercial was everyone's a people person. You need more skills. You need to get it together. And now we have gotten to a place where, hey, let's get back to people skills. Does anyone have people skills anymore? I mean, that's, <laughs> it has fully swung the other way and it, it cracks me up. The, the, I mean, there's like ebbs and flows, right? I mean, I think we all know that, you know, you need it, you need substance, <laughs> right? Like that's the enrichment. You need substance, but you also need people to know that value you provide, right? So there's the people part of it as well as the real like enriching substance piece of it. And so like we are going, we're like toggling back and forth, but I think it's important to sort of understand how the two operate, right? In conjunction with each other. So yeah, yeah, yeah totally. And in, in studying angel investment, the buzzword is always passion. Entrepreneurs think they're passionate. Investors are looking for passion, but that's such a subjective metric. What exactly is the passion that leads to investment and how can we showcase that whether we're pitching our ideas for investment or we're just trying to show that passion at work to get promoted? Yeah. Passion is such a funny word, right? So like passion was a big, like, predict so his passion was one of the things that I looked for when I was studying intuition and gut feel right the extent to which people value um, passion as this positive like it elicits positive gut feels for, gut feel from investors when when somebody's passionate and um, it's so funny because like your definition of passion is going to be different from my passion definition of passion is going to be different from somebody else's definition of passion so like we all have different definitions of passion but 
What's even more interesting is that even within a single person, people are confused about what passion means. So I had this one investor who I was um, was interviewing and he was talking about how he never invests in any entrepreneurs who aren't passionate, right? They've got to be passionate about their company. They, you know, I only invest in people who really just show me passion. And then this same investor, like five minutes later in the same interview was like, oh, and then there's this other guy that I just, I couldn't invest in him because it was like he drank way too much coffee. He was way too passionate Mm -hmm. and it just (laughs) rubbed me the wrong way, right? So even within the same person we have all of these different conceptualizations of what what something is right and so it really goes back to yes there are qualities that we look for in people but it's so dependent on that particular interaction in that space between you and I and what's happening in that space, where we are, the context that we're in, right? Are we in an interview situation? Are we in a social situation? Are we traveling together? Are we, you know, you, again, you know, I, 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 I always say like you switch one variable, right? You switch the industry you're in, you switch the location, you switch the mix of people and everything changes. Right. Your your definition of passion changes, the metrics by which you evaluate passion changes, even the extent to which passion matters, that changes. I think the important lesson in all of this is increasing your emotional intelligence through experience, through that trial and error and not being embarrassed or ashamed of gaining the experience that leads to this emotional intelligence. So you can pick up the context. You can know that being passionate at a social event about your idea is a lot different than being passionate in a boardroom about your idea and being able to dial it into your audience and read those cues just as much as you're managing your own is where that emotional intelligence lies. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the book. It's phenomenal. And of course, giving us some actionable tips here on the show. Where can our audience find more about the work that you do and obviously pick up your book? Yeah, so my website, laurahuang.net. So my first name, last name, H-U-A-N-G.net. Um, lots of sort of tips there. Um, there's also a downloadable guide to finding your edge. And that has lots of sort of how-tos and strategies for um, honing and working on on your edge. Um, and then, you know, of course, all of the, the normal cast of characters. Um, I'm on Twitter, Laura Huang L.A., um, same with Instagram, Laura Huang LA. Um, you know, my my Instagram is slightly weaker than my Twitter game, so I'm working on. I'm aspirationally working okay. on on Instagram, but I'm also you know on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, one video on TikTok, so you know we're getting there. Uh-uh. <laughs> You're officially an influencer. I'm I'm trying. You know, it's hard. That's it's a hard medium. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was such a pleasure chatting with you guys. But I feel alive.